Hello and welcome to the hearing, our music review show. I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I am Scotto. And without, or before we get to this week's movie, um, of course, this is our last episode of 2019, so we're starting with our best of the year list. We do a best and worst on Zombie Takeout, but since we pick almost all the albums we review, a worst would be really difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was one that I was undecided about this year. There were two that you didn't recommend. I don't think we could come up with a worst five. So we just do best. Yeah. Um, you start this one. Uh, I started on Zombie Takeout. Yeah, I was thinking of just going chronologically, honestly, <laughs> instead of ranking them, because I think it would be, I think it would be really hard to uh, to put a number in. Uh-huh. And so uh, we began the year with Jeff Buckley's Grace. It's an album that uh, I listened to a lot the first, I think, few months of the year. For yeah. I thought that would be higher on your list, to be honest. Yeah, so I'm going chronologically. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my number ten is King. Of, I I'm not going chronologically. Um, King of the Surf Guitar by Dick Dale. It was yeah. a real revolution. Um, Agreed. That is on mine too. Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, Jeff Buckley's Grace. Uh, if we were, if I had to have pared it down to a five, hmm. that was an easy one to yeah. would have stayed. Mm-hmm. Dick Dale's maybe. I'm not sure, mm-hmm. but but I loved it and, and couldn't kick it off what's your number nine uh then of course we moved into pearl jams no code which is another one that i probably would have kept if i was mm-hmm. top five. Well, yeah i'm sure pearl jam would have made your top five it um, might have been yeah like just between this and the next one to see which one was going to be the best mm-hmm. and then there's another one too um but uh yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. it was <laughs> it's, it's up there it's easily the top three for me my number nine, another one I think is going to be on both of our lists, Power Station by the Power Station. It did not make Oh, mine. it didn't. Okay, there's no. going to be one surprise on, on your list for me then. Yeah. What's your number nine? Oh, no, you did number nine. You go first. Um, What's your number eight? Uh, the uh, fight between No Code and this one for Best of the Year. Uh, it's David Bowie's Scary Monsters. Um, it's just good God. <laughs> <laughs> And my number eight is as Outlandus de Moore by the police. Uh, I should mention, um, before we started recording, about a half hour before, you messaged me and said you couldn't pare your list down to, f- to five. <laughs> That's right. You needed ten. So I just quickly yes. padded another five on mine. So <laughs> okay. not a whole lot to say about the la- the bottom five for me. Uh, uh, next, moving on for me, um, be uh, Frank Zappa, Zootalors. There's a surprise. <laughs> Uh, Did not expect Zappa on your list. Yeah. <laughs> God, I love Frank. And I don't know if it would have made it if it was just a five, but mm-hmm. uh, it, it kicking it off for in favor of something else was kind of tough, too. So Oddly, given I've been a Zappa fan since the mid-90s, he did not make my list. Um, no. My number seven is Stained by Living Color. Yeah, I, that that one was another tough one to not put on Mm -hmm. (laughs) that power station i really loved it was kind of like but i've got to pare it down man (laughs) number six uh let's see number six oh this one probably would have would not have made it if it was a top five but Mm -hmm. uh i i just love this album so much mars volta francis the mute Mm -hmm. not surprising it's one of the ones you picked i'm sure they were all i knew they were all going to be on the list um, that would have been your number six, I think, of the ones you picked. Yeah, um, it, it definitely it number six. would be um, in the bottom five of the, the if I were doing this. In mm-hmm. this one surprises me on my list because I've been a fan of these guys since college, big fan, one of my absolute favorite bands. But at number six, would not have made my top five. Age of Unreason by Bad Religion. Well, that was another tough one. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I had to kick mm-hmm. them off. Number five. Uh, let's see. Moving on, uh, another one that's just—I mean, this was essential college soundtrack mm-hmm. for me. Uh, Ministry, Land of Rape, and mm-hmm. Honey. And this is my number five essential high school listening for me, among the Living by Anthrax. Oh, that was another one. It was like <laughs> so good. <Yeah. laughs> uh, moving on for me, uh, 
I went with Metric uh-huh. Fantasies. I went with Parlor by Darong Violetta. Loved that album since 2001, and it was great rediscovering it at the yeah. when we reviewed it. I remember enjoying that one a lot, too. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know what? Looking back, because we don't have the same list that we have for Zombie Takeout of right. like what we've done right. exactly. Um, I was like, Jeff Buckley was this year? Yeah. I was kind of shocked by that. Mm-hmm. Like A lot of that, you know, the, the early stuff, I was really shocked by. Mm-hmm. Number three. Uh, and this one could easily be in my top three. It's definitely my album of the year of what's been released this year. And that is Chesky's Sad Fat Luck. My number three is Rhinoceros by Calvo Louise. It was my number one for a long time until we got to some, until we came back from the break. It was my number one. Oh, yeah. Uh, And then uh, we have, uh, of course, (laughs) this should be a surprise. We have tonight's album. Spoiler alert, <laughs> Jethro Tull's Aqualung. Uh, glad I went second. That's why I went to choose to go second. My number two is Just Fred by Fred Schneider. Such a wonderful surprise. Fred Schneider doing punk. <laughs> What's your number one? That uh, was it, Jethro Tull. Oh, Tull was your number one. What was your number two then? You uh, skipped Chesky. Oh, okay, we got a little confused. We got, there were some cross wires there. My number well, one. Well, we we shared a few, remember? Okay, yeah, there were, uh, some got crossed. Like my I number... skipped uh, Dick Dale in the middle there. Oh, that's and, where uh, we got you. you skipped Dick Dale. Okay, that's where I got confused. My yeah. number one, Aqualung by Jeff Tall. Just a quick tangent, something we discussed a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, I should say, um, sure. in reference to this album. Um, we've already discussed this, but uh, when I put when we decided to put this on the list for this week. You had said we're finally getting back to some prog. <laughs> and at the time, I was listening to a lot of Punch Brothers and a lot of St. Vincent. And it occurred to me, there's prog in other genres. Well, sure, but this is prog with the capital. Well, yeah, this is prog rock. But, you know, <laughs> Punch Brothers list them, you know, label themselves as prog, prog bluegrass. I would yeah. say Vince St. Vincent is progressive, um, uh, progressive pop. Um, you in, Actually, in reference to you saying that we were getting back to some prog, I think Chesky is progressive hip-hop. That album is absolutely prog. Oh, yeah. And then his latest, uh, Sans Soleil, is just even more out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say um, uh, Flaming Lips are progressive something. Yeah. I don't know exactly which genre. <laughs> Maybe country. But just uh, something that occurred to me, there is prog in other genres. Just a food for thought. Do you want to share this... anything about your, uh, I mean, we could also talk about our Spotify uh, raps. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, not surprisingly, Bandmade was my number one artist of the year for two years in a row. Yeah, Chesky, uh, Chesky was mine for this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mitski was mine from last year, by the way. Um, and But my artist of the decade was, of course, St. Vincent. Okay, good call. Mine was Bandmade, which surprised me given that I've only <laughs> been a fan since 2015. I wow. listened to them a lot. Well, were you on Spotify back? Uh... Yeah. Back in, uh, I think 2011 I started with them. Oh. Yeah, I go, I go back to 2011 with, with Spotify. So, yeah, well, Bandmade yeah, same, was my... Same here. And then when in. I started going... Yeah, when I started with Spotify is when um, Love This Giant came out. Uh-huh. I, that so... was how I knew I'd been on Spotify longer than I realized because I have I had that in my playlists and you were the one who told me about it many many years ago yeah because of David Byrne and and you were already I, th- I think that's how you found out about St. Vincent yes yes was it because is. of she had worked at Byrne um, and that's when I just went through her old catalog and then by the time I was done with the catalog she came out with self-titled and mm-hmm. it's like what are the, just what are those things of how they work out I think my other top artist, um, I don't remember all five. It was Bandmade, um, Cake was in there, um, Boingo, um, Squeeze, because there are like two song, two or three songs of theirs I listen to a lot. Um, apparently it cuts off in November because it, does, it didn't, it doesn't, there's no St. Vincent or Punch Brothers who have been, I've been obsessed with for the last couple of months. Um, yeah, mine's a local rapper named Serengeti, um, mm-hmm. who, I mean, He's just, uh, he's pretty much the Herman Melville of hip hop, I would say. 
<laughs> He's on our list. We'll be getting to him eventually. Uh, I don't even know how we break it down because, like, his story goes for well, at least the story of Kenny Dennis goes like like eight chapters at least, or eight album or nine mm-hmm. albums. It's it's insane. It really is insane. <laughs> That's not just like. A... But uh, oh. I'm trying to think. Metric was also on mine in my top five. Calvo um, Louise was the one I couldn't think of. They're my second artist of the of the year. Mm. Cake, Squeeze, and Blango. Um, top, top songs, Hide and Seek by Band Maid. Um, Pictures of Matchstick Men by Camper Van Beethoven. Really? The, the Camper Van Beethoven song I listen to the most is a cover, oddly enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had a chance. I, I'm kicking myself because I missed out on seeing him. He was doing like a double bill where he opened as Camper Van Beethoven mm. or opened as Cracker and then closed as Camper Van Beethoven. Nice. But like could not make it to the show unfortunately um also i have my top songs long line of cars by cake which has become my favorite cake song it was symphony and Sick. you know i'm not sure how they compute the 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 top songs because i listened to mostly the whole album mm-hmm. so but them taking a song off the album really i mean maybe they just picked one that maybe there's one that you lean a little more toward I, you know, sometimes I don't think so. I think it's when I'm Mm. compiling a list or making a decision. Mm. Sometimes I'll just go back and listen to a song again. Mm. So, I mean, (laughs) I I think it was that. So I didn't really pay attention to which songs they took. The last two of my top songs, Pulling Muscles from Michelle, one of those few squeeze songs I listen to a lot. And The Sign of Fire by The Fix, the only song of theirs I listen to regularly. Wow. So you have a set number of, of older songs that you, you go back to. I'm typical of my age. I mean, a lot of my favorites are new. Marion Call Band made, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Punch Brothers, fairly, fairly new artists. But I'm very typical middle-aged, a, a very typical middle-aged person in that nine times out of ten when I pick up Spotify, it's 80s and early 90s. Huh. I, I listen to stuff from my teens and early 20s. I mean, I like bringing the stuff back, definitely. You know, mm. but yeah, I also like, of course, seeking out new life and civilizations, oh, yeah. as they say. I, I do that too. I mean, <laughs> all, most of my top five artists are fairly new. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down to it, and I'm just going to relax and put some music on, it's going to be older. It's going to be you know, 20, 30 years old. Yeah. And that is, I mean, a lot of times when I'm working, so it has to just be something if I'm like not completely bored. Mm. It has to be something that I can just yeah. get in a trance to, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, I simply, the way I can simply explain it is, as much as I, you know, might appreciate a gourmet meal, you know, uh, I, I lean into comfort food. <laughs> <laughs> the early '90s and '80s is comfort food musically for me. All right, so finally on to this week's album, which is from 1971, Aqualung by Jethro Tull. Jethro Tull are a progressive rock band formed in Blackpool, Lancashire in 1967, who are best known probably for the flute playing of frontman and primary songwriter Ian Anderson, and for a couple of songs on this week's album. Aqualung is the band's fourth studio album, and it's the one that started their shift toward progressive rock from their blues rock and jazz fusion beginnings. It's also not, unlike most people think, it's not a concept album. Right, they they have the two first two songs connecting, well, no, uh, and I'm not. Oh, Ian Anderson has actually talked about this. Um, he said that, he's basically said that just because three or four songs on the album share a theme, that doesn't make it a concept album. And it actually has two sides that have their own themes. So it's, if anything, yeah. it's two con- concept EPs. <laughs> right. Um, right. They recorded their next album, Thick as a Brick, as a sort of spoof of concept albums. Yeah, that, that backfired. <laughs> they, they were kind of just, you know, it was, a, it was a middle finger to the people who thought, ah, oh, cool, was a concept album. You want to see a concept album? We'll give you a concept album. Because the, the problem, the reason why it backfired was a lot of people thought that was a concept album, too. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so they, it, just, it just dug them in deeper. It was just not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Of course, Aqualung was released on March 19th, 1971 on Chrysalis slash Island Records in Europe 
and Reprise in America, Japan, and Oceania, produced by Ian Anderson and Terry Ellis, and features Ian Anderson on lead vocals, acoustic guitar, and flute, Martin Barr on electric guitar and descant recorder, Jeffrey Hammond, credited as Jeffrey Hammond Hammond, I always got a kick out of that, <laughs> on bass guitar, alto recorder, backing vocals, and odd voices, John Evan on piano, organ, and mellotron, Clive and Clive Bunker on drums and percussion, as well as Glenn Cornick on bass guitar. He played with the band at rehearsals for the album in June of 70, some of which may also have been recording sessions, uh, particularly My God and Wondering Aloud. He's not credited on the albums, but he may be on there. That's kind of weird, though, because, I mean, how do they not... I mean, wouldn't he come looking for a paycheck? (laughs) I don't know. <laughs> How do they prove if he was on bass or not? But Anyway, reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnandscotto.com, that's John A-N-D, Scotto, uh, you'll find links to the album on Spotify and YouTube. On to the tracks and on to side one, and for once I'm going to talk about the individual sides. Because yes. they have titles and themes. Side right. one is called Aqualung. Starts off with... The title track, Aqualung, probably their most iconic song. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what can you say, really? This is, I mean, and, this is a masterpiece. And typically, Ian Anderson writes all the songs. I, I called him the primary songwriter. He's really the only songwriter. Yeah. Um, we reviewed um, Nightmare Before Christmas on the latest um, Zombie Takeout, and it's very much like Elfman was in Oingo Boingo. He wrote everything. Everybody else just played it. Um, Anderson wrote everything. The other guys just played it. Um, the lyrics on this one, this was an exception. It was co-written. The lyrics were co-written by Ian Anderson and his wife at the time, Jenny Anderson, um, based on a photo of a homeless man that she had taken as a photography student. And, uh, that's quite the alimony check, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, apparently she wrote the first half of the lyric, um, but that riff is, and, and it's really not just a guitar riff. It's known as a guitar riff, but it's really the beginning of the vocal melody too. And it's yeah. just iconic. Uh, I mean, Bar, was it Bar that you pronounced it? Yeah, yeah it's Bar, Martin Bar. Uh, I just, <laughs> what can you say about him? An unsung a, guitar hero. Jesus you know, Christ. He, he deserves as much credit as the Yardbirds tr- you know, Trinity. He, he's an amazing guitar player. Like, did they have... Um... They have like Iomi replace him like later on, you know. I don't remember. I think there were other guitar players. Like, and I think Ian Anderson was the only member of Jethro Tull who's done everything, who's been on every album. Well, right. It it became like almost an Alice Cooper situation mm-hmm. where the band just became mm-hmm. a person, you right. know. Um, like, but I think Barr's been there for most of it. Yeah. Um, his guitar just... is just as much a part of it as Anderson's voice. Right. Speaking of which, Anderson is probably, I would say, definitely my favorite vocalist. And and he is just a hero of mine. Just every note he sings drips with attitude. Right. The, he, he is truly an actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as well as a singer. Yeah, we've talked he... about, you know, singers who act in their you know, in their vocal no one does that better than Anderson. Right. But it, it starts with this iconic, heavy riff. But I love that you can hear an acoustic behind it. Sometimes I would even say he might even get too much into character. He may, we'll even, say. He may even cross the line on some <laughs> occasions. Where but, it's like, okay, that's a bit much. Hmm. But, I mean, it's still it's still him, you know? It's, it's it like Jeffrey works. Combs. He overacts, but it's fun. Yeah, it's true. That's um, very true. It's but I, I love that you can. Actually. I love that you Jeffrey can hear. Of singers. Yeah. I love that you can hear the acoustic behind this enormous riff. Mm-hmm. It's just beautifully mixed, and, and the think, just abrupt change to that soft section. I think, and this is why I had to listen to a different, um, a different mix. And mm-hmm. I wish I had some more time to prepare for this one mm-hmm. to have listened to it in a few other different ways. But I had never noticed until the first time I listened to this that um, that they're also playing recorder along with that riff. Okay, I didn't notice it, but it doesn't surprise me. It is you. It is very much. I never noticed it before. There's a lot of I, recorder on the album. But yes, they're playing that riff on the recorder. 
which just think about how a recorder sounds. Yeah, yeah. And dun 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 dun. <laughs> Only it's do 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 do. And the Spotify version of the special edition or whatever version we li- I li- we listen to of this one has an interview with Anderson. Uh, about thirteen minute interview, and he said that those were just cheap recorders that a school would use. Of course. Well, nobody makes a good recorder. No, they do, do they? actually. They're a nice wooden recorder. <laughs> no. Yes, there are actually good quality recorders. It is a serious instrument. That just, just can't be. Do they find the brown noise? <laughs> there are actually very expensive, <laughs> nice wooden recorders. Um, but they just use cheap plastic store, you know, school you know great grade school recorders which amazes me given some of the playing on this album well i mean this wasn't a big budget album i mean i'm i'm kind of shocked that this was their fourth album honestly <laughs> i did not know that i assumed this was either their first or second and i think it was well no, i have it in my notes the record label um the studio they were using um was being shared by zeppelin at the time Wow, and Zeppelin does come up in my notes later because I think there's something that Zeppelin might have borrowed from them. Mm -hmm. Um, There were two rooms in the studio, one was small room, one big room. Zeppelin booked it first, so they got the nice intimate small room. Of course. Anderson basically hated the recording. The band pretty much hated recording this album because it was in this big room that was intended for orchestras and just didn't work for a rock band. Mm. Um. But it comes in with this abrupt change where it gets very soft. Yeah. And there's this radio effect on Anderson's voice that stays up through like a line or two into the next section. It stays longer than you think it would. Right. And just for the people who don't speak British, I have to explain a dog end. There's a line. He bends to pick a dog end. A dog end is a cigarette butt with some unsmoked tobacco on it. That makes sense. Uh, I mean, I would, I've never really analyzed the lyrics all that much. That line always jumped out at me before I knew what a dog end was. Which is a shame because, I mean, especially this this song itself, lyrically, it is just so bold, you know? Mm-hmm. it's uh, Now, I'm sure folk music has sung about homeless people in of the course. past and the, the vagrant and the wanderer and stuff. But rock never really did it, you know? No, no. It was never rock's thing. Rock was about, you know, we're having a good time and, and this. And this is just a slap in the face. Just, you know, it's so real and gritty. Yeah. Yet at the same time, it's so pompous. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's tall, you know? It yeah. is so classical and folk. And it also... It's just as heavy as Black Sabbath. Yeah, of course. And the slow section builds into this, you know, a little bit faster section, but his voice still remains affected for parts of that. So yeah. when it, the effect does come off, it really grabs your attention. Oh, you, yeah. Do you yeah, still remember to spend burst foggy freeze? They, they are just making a splash with this intro, mm-hmm. with this intro track. And it wasn't until I listened to it for this album, for this review, I should say, that I realized why it's called Aqualung. Oh, the deep sea diver sound. Yeah. Then you the snatch your rat- rattling last breath with deep sea diver sounds. I yeah. I love this album. I love Tall. I've heard it a billion <laughs> times. That n- I never connected deep sea diver sounds to Aqualum. And the, the odd thing, I, I have always liked Tall, but I've never listened to this album. I mean, mm-hmm. I've listened to oh, wow. Aqualum, of course. I've huh. listened to a couple oh, of yeah, songs off it. Um, there, I, I'm going to say you've heard this, obviously. You've heard Locomotive Breath. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to venture to say you've heard Cross-Eyed Mary. Yes. Yeah, that's probably it. There, there's, I think, one other okay. song. So this is going to be a really interesting review for me, because I know this album cold. I, you know what? I don't think their entire catalog was on Spotify for for a while. Mm. Like, I had, like, their greatest hits kind of thing, so I, I went in that way. I have MU and Original Masters. That's what, that's what sold me. Yeah, original masters. That that I mean, it was just such a great buy mm. to get, you know. And this is actually the only other tall album that I, the only actually full tall full tall album that I own, aside from the best of, is Aqualung, because it's just like the, yeah, the classic. Like I think I've listened to Thick as a Brick, 
but I don't think I've listened to any other Tall album all the way through. Oh, well. Um, now, I will admit the lyrics do get a bit repetitive, you know, after that, the, after the guitar solo, which is brilliant. Um, yeah. They kind of bring back the same lyrics, kind of recycles them a bit. Um, yeah, but I don't think that's a problem at all in this case, because it's just, it moves so quickly. You know, there's no way you could get bored listening to this mm, song. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Uh, I'm just trying to nitpick anything I possibly can because this is a fucking masterpiece. This yeah. album as a whole. Um, and I love how the heavy riff comes back at the end. Yeah. It's just a complete restatement. On to track two, Cross-Eyed Mary. A uh, little uh, bit of trivia about this one. This was written by tall frontman Ian Edison, who has described the character of Mary as a schoolgirl prostitute type. She lives a wretched existence offering her services to the dregs of humanity. Office Anderson says that the important issue in this song and the album as a whole is seeing the spirituality in people, even a prostitute. Said Anderson, quote, There are these human types that would be thought to be undesirable and unpleasant, but are all God's creations one way or another. And there must be within these people some very essential humanity, even some goodness, some good side to their character or personality, which is laudable. I always thought this was about the church. No, no. I mean, I thought they were comparing the church to a prostitute. Uh, well, maybe in the second side. <laughs> well, no, I just always I thought this was one of the songs that fit into the criticism of the church, which is really just the second side. The first yeah. side, Aqualung, is about um, p- basically people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Right, which is really unique for the time. I feel. Yeah. He did uh, not just one song, but an entire side of an album is about the disenfranchised. I mean, it's kind of like Genesis took this like later on for the, for the lamb. Well, mm. you could say Peter Gabriel took it because yeah. the, the rest just were, right. went along for the ride with them. <laughs> right. But they wanted something real and gritty. And, mm. you know, but this definitely had to have been an influence on in that. Yeah. I love the intro. It is iconic. It's just this repeated kind of fluttery flute riff over (laughs) these chord changes. And the flute riff is the same as even as the chord changes, which sets up a really interesting contrast. Right. I mean, there's it's classical, it's rock, it's tribal, Mm -hmm. it's jazz, all the same. thing. And it just builds and builds. And there's this really tight interplay between the guitar and the organ in the verse. Yeah. I'm tempted to call this proto metal. Oh, e- well, no, the genre, and in fact, I bring this up, you, these guys really deserve that metal Grammy. It, they got a, be- a Grammy years ago, I'm sure you've all heard about this, for Best Metal Artist. Right. For Crest of a Knave, I think it was. I, I thought it might have been like a live album, actually. It might have been. It was in the 80s, though, so it was around Crest of a Knave. And that live album was fucking phenomenal, too. If I, <laughs> I remember that album as uh-huh. a kid. Uh, probably my intro to them but it, it's really the genre of metal that changed by by yeah. maybe it wasn't 89 metal but they're certainly right along with black sabbath yeah I mean, and this they are contemporaries to black sabbath i think they were a little bit before uh I ra- probably around the same time because i think sabbath might have been 69 sabbath, sabbath's first album was six formed in 69 first album was 70 i believe yeah so, so they, was a little ahead of them yeah well, I think they they were moving into this metal oh, around the same time as Sabbath. Came around, around the same time, right? Okay. And I mean, the genre of metal changed because if you listen to Sabbath now, it's not really what no. we would think metal. No. But back then, that that sure as hell was metal. I mean, and the genre of metal changed just going back a couple of years for us, thanks to Lemmy. Yeah, you know he he sped everything up. Before then metal was slow and prodding it was an offshoot of prog really in the end acid rock more so i would say well yeah but i mean it, i yeah, mean it all those... kind of mesh it's all kind of muddled in there but and let's be honest those early metallica albums were, well, prog they were definitely without, prog influenced. without yeah. keyboards <laughs> yeah that was prog i mean you have a bass player soloing it's prog <laughs> right but metal as a whole i i would say sabbath got it from acid rock yeah, and Hendrix, who was so with Saul here. Rock. If you took the flute and recorders out, yeah, you would pretty much be listening to a Black Sabbath record or a Zeppelin <laughs> record. On the heavier like stuff, yeah. Zeppelin as you know, a metal band or right. early metal. Well, proto-metal. they were hard rock. That that was always a very clear distinction for me. Sabbath was metal. 
Zeppelin was hard rock. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to tell, tougher to tell back then. Mm. Um, but going back to the car said Mary, love how the, how forward the bass is in in verse two because in the first verse it just kind of follows the the guitar. It's very simple. Then the bass just comes alive in in verse two. Love that. And this is our first flute solo. <laughs> And it goes from a flute solo to a guitar solo, which is absolutely emblematic of Tall. It is. He goes right in. He's playing right along with the flute on the fucking guitar. <laughs> flute solo, guitar solo, there's a little crossover. That is Tall in a nutshell. At least oh, this yeah. era. I mean, the verse in this is straight up rock, if yeah. not metal mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, it's part of metal. Um, and I like how they kind of reference that repeated riff in the beginning at the end without quoting it. Yeah. They kind of do something very similar. Um, and now on to track three. I'm going to venture to say you haven't heard this one, but you hadn't nope. heard this one first. No, before. I haven't. Um, Cheap Day Return. This was written by Ian Anderson, but of course, um, about visiting his father who was terminally ill at the time or, or was dying at the time. Um, love the instrumental portion of this. Starts off with this kind of counterpoint between two guitars. And I just want to point out, Ian Anderson is credited with playing all the acoustics on this. Oh, okay. On the record. This is probably all Anderson, mm. which is amazing. I, I never knew he was this talented of a guitarist. I just assumed Barr was, yeah. you know, good I, on... I assumed it was Barr, at least the more complicated stuff, but only Anderson is credited with playing acoustic. Huh. Um, but I love the instrumental portion. It's just complex and haunting. It's a beautiful mix of classical and folk. And then the lyrics come in, uh, and it's about him visiting his father. And it's it's okay. I, I think it's it feel it should have been an instrumental or developed into a full lyric. I think. I mean, it's a nice interlude on yeah. the album. It just kind of seems half finished. Yeah, they couldn't really commit. This is my pick for weakest. I love the song. I mean, just picking a, a weakest on this one, I'm still picking a favorite. <laughs> it's it's tough. You know, I thought I had a weak, weakest on the first listen, but on the second listen, I was kind of in getting into that too. So it's kind of like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, by by weakest, it's like, how do you pick your least favorite of your children? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's all still brilliant. On to track three, my favorite my of the, on the album, Mother Goose. This is not only my favorite of the album, it's one of my favorite Tall songs. Um, tied with War Child for my absolute favorite Tall song. I just love how his line, his voice rides this line between pretty and sinister. <laughs> I, I mean, this is a, probably their folkiest yeah, yeah. on the album, I think. And uh, it, I the think... lyrics are just this pastiche of these bizarre characters. That he, he's walking past Hampstead, Hampstead Fair and he runs into these, you know, bizarre fictional creatures or characters. Right. And at first, I, the first listen, I was kind of disappointed on this because it was, you know, I felt I, I kept wanting to hear more bar and more mm -hmm. of the metal side. But in the second listen, just the whole back and forth with it yeah. was really, really entertaining. And, this and is, yeah, this is one of those songs where it's just Anderson having fun. Yeah. You know. There's some really nice subtle percussion. Um, and I love the Chicken Fancier verse. And the Chicken Fancier came to play with his long rat big, long rat beard and his sister's weird. She drives a lorry for his for truck. <laughs> it's just the bizarre lyrics. Um, he was just having fun with this one. Yeah. Um, great harmonies on the, the second and third choruses. Uh, the Long John, starting with the Long John Silver line. Um, and I love the uh, the guitar interlude before the bass and electric guitar come in. Because it kind of picks up partway through. Yeah. And just the trailing off recorders at the end. <laughs> they almost sound backwards. <laughs> On it is track an interesting five. song, yeah. <clears throat> On to track five, Wondering Aloud, another favorite of mine. Um, really nice touching lyric and just pretty melody. Just nice, nice little, another one of the short interludes. I almost picked this as a weakest, but I realized it was just because of the, the listing, you know, because they had pretty much three acoustic in a row and it was just kind of, 
you know, by this point, I was you were getting, getting a tired. You were getting tired of three, six. Yeah. <laughs> Love but this one. Uh, it's just really know, pretty. Um, my weakest because I really liked it the, the second listen. <laughs> Um, I like how the timing varies a little bit. They have a little fun with that because there knows there's no percussion on it. Nice, nice build to a, a piano that comes in, and then Mellotron comes in with these strings that just build it a little more. And the le- I'm planning to get the last line tattooed on me. It's one of my favorite things ever written, and it's only the giving that makes you what you are. Oh, uh. some of top Ian Anderson's finest writing. A very. This yeah, they had a very King Crimson uh, feel on this one. Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. On to track six, up to me. Love the riff on this one. Love how the guitar again, the acoustic guitar is mixed in with electric really nicely. Yeah, the riff, is, the riff is fucking fantastic mm-hmm. on this. And you've got these two acoustics playing each other, playing against each other in the verse. And this is really kind of just about hanging out in a bar. As a you know, working class person dreaming about something better. There's a line about a silver cloud, which is a kind of Rolls Royce. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm one of the lyric is one of the lyrics is I'm a common working man with a half of bitter bread and jam. You know, um, something about and then something I've, I I would you know lay one on you when the copper turn fades away. It, it's just a you know, sitting in a bar getting into a fight, dreaming of a better life. It's another one I really wish. Uh, like on the first one, listen, I really wish I just went all in. Mm-hmm. But then when I listen to it again, you, you really, I get the, the play back and forth and it's yeah. just, uh, it, tell it's us just all about the subtlety. Yeah. You know, there's a ton of subtlety in their music. I've heard aqua long. I don't know how many times and I never noticed the, the recorder. I never did either. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> just a quick recommendation. You talked about going back and listening to things. If this at all appeals to you, just go to Spotify, go to the tall section, hit play. <laughs> well, th- that's the problem. They have too many like bonus tracks and stuff. Well, that's, and that's true. That's true. A pain in the ass. Yeah, fair <laughs> point. I, um, I, I swear they didn't have this on though before, you know, or I would mm-hmm. would have. I really would have assumed that I would have listened to to their just did a, a whole you know catalog listen, which I've done with a number of bands. On to side two, titled My God, starting with the song My God. Um, another favorite of mine. Loved I think the this be- might be my pick for, for that, favorite, honestly. Loved the acoustic guitar part. Again, Anderson blew me away on that one. I had no idea he was that good. It's very classical sounding. I think this one, I think Zeppelin was listening closely. and uh, mm-hmm. On the beginning, yeah. Took a little stuff from this. <laughs> <laughs> I just love how dramatic it is once the actual song kicks in and then what about the crazy breakdown mm-hmm. <laughs> you get this chorus in the middle and it's just this is the the point where you, you mentioned him overacting I think he does on this one oh yeah but it oh, works yeah. beautiful <laughs> yeah. I mean they just there's nothing left undone here uh, and most of this side of the album is a criticism of the Church of England. Yeah. And what I find interesting about it is it's a criticism from someone who is clearly a believer. Oh, yeah. Which I think for me, as a, as a you know, screaming atheist, gives it more emotional weight. Well, yeah, that's also, I mean, that that's like Chesky's stuff. It's somebody like, you know, tell me tell me how to believe you know Mm -hmm. like how do i how do i buy into this if i even really wanted to buy into it tell me how to do that because you know that's it's not just a random criticism that i've heard a billion times before it's someone who wants to who who, you know is really rooting for the church wants it to do right but just is, is you know calling it out from inside now remember there was a long and of course this is what are we talking 25 years ago mm-hmm. i i did an easter show mm-hmm. and i was looking for an easter songs and uh this this definitely should have been it yeah. this is kind of a, uh, an interest unintentional good pick for our holiday episode yeah um for both themes on the album um yeah, anderson described himself as being somewhere between a deist and a pantheist 
Um, but he, he has said that the Christianity doesn't necessarily disagree with either of that. It, um, and, and I love it when the band kicks in. Because most of it is just piano and vocal. Yeah. And then the band kicks in about halfway through. And it's just, it, it's, it's a kick in the head. Oh, yeah. Catches you completely off guard. Um, Going to quote lyrics again. I love this part. So lean upon him gently and don't call, upon, don't call on him to save you from your social graces and the sins you used to wave. W-A-I-V-E. Right. Um, his voice is just this great mix of grief and rage. You know, he's, he's, it's, it's sad, but he's angry as well. And then we get another amazing flute and guitar trade-off. And then, yeah, th- this Baroque section. <laughs> you talked about the breakdown. I'm finally yes! to that note. Yes! It just goes completely Baroque. It's insane. It's just like... <laughs> All I imagine was Robert Fripp listening to this going, <laughs> the fuck didn't I think of that? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the classical influence. Yes. You know, um, a lot of people talk about, you know, classical being, being an influence on frog. These guys were classical folk. I, I and mean, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer didn't even go here at this point, yeah. you know. I mean, they, they, I mean, and they, you know, covered classical music in, in rock form at that point. But, um, formal yeah. music was a huge influence on Tall, I think, more so than any of the other prog bands. Well, um, I don't know. ELP was, was very well, yeah, classical. True, true. I they'd, mean, they they'd, unironically. They'd be second did jerusalem yeah true yeah I know. it's a tough call between <laughs> um lake and or not greg Lake. i would say probably emerson if yeah, any of them. between lake and emerson yeah of course and between anderson and emerson who was more classical influenced classically influenced um on to track eight him 43 this is another one that gets radio play a lot this is the the one i had heard before because this was the one you recommended for me to do on that easter oh, show okay, okay. years ago <laughs> I probably didn't know um, my God at the time. Um, <laughs> and Anderson has described this as a blues for Jesus about the gory glory seekers who use the name as an excuse for, to, for a lot of unsavory things. You know, hey, dad, it's not my fault. The missionaries lied. <laughs> he it's doesn't exactly, really. Hmm? This is like Chesky's latest single too. Mm-hmm. like um, Christ of the Cross is about, you know, the state murdered him. And then they turned around and used him. <laughs> and Anderson does a really interesting thing at the beginning. He comes in vocally on the upbeat. It's the vocal starts at a weird spot because normally they start on the downbeat. I don't know if I've ever noticed that. That's uh. So, and maybe I only notice because I'm a musician, but it, it just the vocal comes in on a weird spot. I'm trying to think of how a vocal would normally start. <laughs> and, well, you he, know, he, he drops father on the downbeat. Yeah. So, oh, father, my father, whatever the, the opening line, the first word is on an upbeat. Um, it's just an unusual thing for a vocal to do. Um, really like the piano on this one. This is really a piano song. Yeah. Um, the bass on the riff is great, too, because it's, it's this sort of... He does a similar thing on Locomotive Breath, where it's a sort of pulsing, sliding bass part. Um, and this is where you get Anderson's sarcasm. He's a sarcastic motherfucker at times. Um, you know, And the unsung Western hero, he killed an Indian or three, then he made his name in Hollywood to, send the, to set the white men free. <laughs> so far ahead of his time oh absolutely <laughs> and a great solo from martin Barr. again a, a criminally underrated guitar player or not underrated but unsung because he's not one of those guitar players who gets a lot of attention on to track nine slipstream this one is just really pretty very classical influenced and this really is really pretty music and vocal melody contrast with his really critical lyrics um and it's, i normally find these interludes throwaway songs just easy to say oh that one's my mm-hmm. weakest because it's an interlude yeah but they they just work here yeah. um the lyric it's very short i can quote it offhand well the lush un- separation unfolds you and the products products of wealth 
not offhand, I am reading it, um, push you along <laughs> on the bow wave of their spiritless undying selves, and you press on God's way to your last dime as he hands you the bill, and you spin the slipstream, tideless, unreasoning, paddle right out of the mess, and you paddle right out of the mess. It's the, it's the rich buying themselves into high positions in the church. He gets in and out saying what needs to be said. Mm-hmm. Sometimes a minute and 13 seconds is all you really need. Yeah. And there's some really nice atonal strings at the end. Probably a Mellotron because there, there are no string credits on the album. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mellotron. I don't probably. know how we detune the Mellotron. <laughs> <laughs> On to track 10, Locomotive Breath. I've, <laughs> I've got a chunk of trivia on this one. Ever wondered what if uh, Billy Joel, uh, you know... <laughs> I've never <laughs> known what this... Lo- to New York State of Mind. <laughs> I've never known what this song was about until today. Oh, really? It was inspired by Anderson's concern regarding overpopulation. He explained in a Rolling Stone interview early this year, quote... It was my first song that was perhaps on a topic that would be a little more appropriate in today's world. It was about the runaway runaway train of population growth and capitalism. It was based on the sorts of unstoppable those sorts of unstoppable ideas. We're on this crazy train. We can't get off of it, Ozzy. Um, (laughs) Where is it going? Bear in mind, of course, when I was born in '47, the the population of planet Earth was slightly less than a third of what it is today. So it should be a sobering thought that in one man's lifetime, our planet po- planetary population has more than tripled. You'd think population growth would have brought prosperity, happiness, food, and a reasonable spread of wealth, but quite the opposite has happened. Uh, and this is happening even more to this day. Without putting it uh, into too much literal detail, this is what lay behind that song. Wow, that I did, I did not know. I mean, I knew there was, you know... A sense of depravity, you know, mm-hmm. and just emptiness. You know, the all-time loser. All-time, his children jumping off at stations one by one. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, add so much context to the song, and this one again is just iconic. This this is one of the two songs that I, I said they're known for one or two, best known for two songs on this album. This is the other one. Yeah, this is just so fucking good. This song. It's absolutely iconic. And it opens with this really soft interplay between the piano and guitar. That's kind of this calm before the storm. Right. It starts off like Billy Joel. Yeah. yeah. It's like Paige Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just kind of in free time. Um, you know, this, this they kind of play off of each other, kind of duel. And then this blues groove, kind, blues groove kind of comes in, they, you know, play together. And then it all sort of explodes. It has this bouncy bass that goes to it too, and, and yeah, this the bass slides. I love the bass slide slides. Right. And again, I, I would say I would characterize it more as bouncy, but yeah, I could see how that that's a slide. I only say slide because I was watching a live version. Um, <laughs> for the, the the video this week, I put out a live version of Aqualon, but I had considered a live version of this one. And I'm watching John Hammond Hammond play, and he's actually sliding on the bass. You would think he'd be the keyboard player if yeah, he, Hammond that Hammond, name. Yeah. But, you know. But it's, it, it explodes into this immensely heavy riff. But again, like Aqualung, you can still hear the acoustic behind it. Yeah. I love how they mix the acoustics. Um, it does get a bit repetitive because it is really just this one riff. But it serves the point of the song, especially now you know what it's about. I mean, it's only a four-minute song. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's radio-friendly, you know. And it's overplayed, but still good. How many songs you can can you say that about that you still enjoy, even though you've heard yeah. them like billions of times? Again, we get another great flute solo. Um, Crazy flute solo. <laughs> and I love how he makes these sort of sounds, vocal sounds, in the middle of his solos. Well, the way they've mixed this, you can hear him breathing, breathing and, and yeah. you know. But he just it, lets out this kind of in the middle uh, of the solo, which I love. Which, yeah, I remember in past mixes, you could hear the... I uh. <laughs> love that part. Uh, and knowing what it's about now, I, I listened to it after I read that. And it Yeah, just I've got to listen to it again. Brings so much to the song. And it's really the it's the one exception on this side of the album. It's, that's not about the church. 
Well, you know, I had just put it in that context that it was about the church because, you know, he the the loser is still picking up Gideon's Bible. And yeah, there's a reference to Gideon's Bible. That's I probably um, never caught it, noticed it as a difference. And the stations, I'd always assumed, were the stations yeah, of the yeah. cross. Hmm. There might be some cross-pollination. There, there might be a few ideas in it. But um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how that ties in with the, the overpopulation. But I guess the church has encouraged overpopulation. Yeah, well, the stations I think are just literal train stations. Yeah, I Child, assume they were children jumping the off at stations one by one, kind of expanding. Yeah, you know, expanding the population throughout the world. The Gideon's Bible line. I should have looked at the lyrics. I don't know what the exact line is about Gideon's Bible. Uh, he picks up Gideon's Bible, uh, opens up to page one. Okay. Thank God. Oh, I can't remember the the exact Thank God he lyric. stole the handle on the train. It won't stop going. No way to slow down. That's that's the yeah. one repeated line in the chorus. That's the chorus. Um, on to track 11, the final song, Wind Up. This is the perfect closer to the album. Starts off this nice, pretty song, piano and vocal, with this earnest yet biting lyric about the church. You know, um, when I was young and they sent me off to school with their half-assed smiles and the book of rules, I didn't mind if they groomed me for success or if they said that I was just a fool. And, I mean, it's a multi-directional song. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's great that I, I've got to hear this, but it kind of was just like, I wish I'd heard this earlier mm -hmm. in life. <laughs> this is one of those, I was talking about how his his earnestness and the fact that he's legitimately a believer with these concerns, it even moves an, an atheist like me. You yeah. Know? Um, and then it gets heavy. Yeah. And this is another case of proto metal. It is just straight up metal. Uh, yeah, I actually I think I had heard like a live version of this uh -huh. sometime uh, mm, long nice. ago. And there's a lyric in here that chokes me up every fucking time. And I actually mishear the first line of it every time. Um the line I hear is how do you dare to tell me that I'm not part of the song? Huh. Which for me, being disabled, which kills me. Um, oh, the, the full line I've written. Um, how do you dare me dare to tell me that I'm my father's son when that was just an accident of birth? I'd rather look around me, compose a better song, because that's the honest measure of my worth. Now, wow. it, that I'm not part of the song to me as a disabled person really resonated. But the the lyric is written, and this is not Ian Anderson's intention, I'm sure. But after a year plus of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> how do you dare to tell me that I'm my father's son when that was just an accident of birth that that just I, I honestly cried listening to this wow. today um, you know the, the, this is again another one of my absolute favorites and that long, that, 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 that couplet just kills me every it, fucking time yeah you put it in that context so that is just god that is damn amazing and this is obviously it's about the church in Anderson's case he was writing about the church but well yeah but, you know, in, in two contexts, or be it just, you know, kills yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and this, again, one of my few rare criticisms on the album, because it is a fucking masterpiece. The <laughs> solo does get a bit meandering. It's not Bar's <laughs> finest moment. <laughs> I just like hearing him play, though. I, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, wish they'd just, let him go a little freer on this. Yeah, he just gets a little bit. It didn't need a solo. He just kind of fills it. It's filler to me. Um, but I love how it gets soft at the end again, yeah. just to drive home the point and it ends like it started. It's right. just this, just the piano and the vocal and this earnest plea. Foregone conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> considering it is, we both named it as our favorite album of the year. Yeah. You know, obviously we both recommend it. I don't know if I would put it at my, in my top spot. I mean, it's certainly in my top five though. It was your favorite of the year. Um, of all time, it's, yeah, same. It's probably in my top five. I I didn't include it in my Desert Island discs. I have that listed in, on a Google Doc, but I need to add it now. Well, I went in chronological order for my list. Oh, okay. Right, 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 right. So, uh, I mean, it definitely is in the, in the top five. Uh -huh. And I don't know if I could pick it. 
And, you know, honestly, it does say a lot because I think in the other four that would have been in my top five, I could pick weak tracks. I don't know if I could pick one on this, though. Yeah. Like, it would have to be one of those interludes. Yeah, I, I strain to pick a week one. Even though, as much as I love Cheap Day Return, I just think it's a little incomplete. I mean, maybe Wandering Aloud? I don't know. <laughs> I think Wandering Aloud would probably uh-huh. get it. And sh- and then there's the, the struggle of picking the strongest. Do you mm-hmm. go with Aqualung, which, of course, is the masterpiece? Uh, I really enjoyed My God, though. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, Locomotive Breath is just it's just outrageous it's fucking incredible there are two tall songs i listen to on a very regular basis um the one i picked i'm blanking on the name um how did i honestly my favorite tall song still though Mm -hmm. um would be living in the past interesting not one (laughs) of my favorites that's that's an interesting call um but mother goose and, and war child are the two tall songs that i listen to a ton so and obviously one of the, only one of them's on this album, so that had to be my favorite. And I think why that one has always been one of my favorites because the flute mm-hmm. really works yeah. on that song yeah. so well. Like it all just comes together, but, and he's you know, just grooving with the flute. Uh-huh. <laughs> but on this, um, ah, you know, I just can't get away from locomotive breath. I mm-hmm. think. Uh-huh. I'll pick that as my choice. They're all good. There's, there's no bad choice on this one. Yeah. Um, that's it I... for Aqualung. Well, just to, to cap her, like Calva, Calva Louise was my favorite for the year. And then we got to Fred Schneider. And Fred Schneider edged them out. Because it was just Wait. such a great surprise. Wait, you picked Fred Schneider as your favorite for the year? No, no. It was. Oh, okay. Up until we reviewed, up until we came back from the break, Calva Louise was a solid favorite of the year. Yeah. We get the Fred Schneider. It was just such a great surprise. It he edged them out. We get to this week, and Tall just decimated everybody. <laughs> like I, I, I didn't even need to list a top ten. Like I could have just said this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is all ten. <laughs> and that's unfortunately it for Aqualung. Until next year, when we'll be revealing Blue Valentine by Tom Waits. Finally, getting to some Tom Waits. Tom Waits is someone I've only recently developed an appreciation for. It took me a long time to get what he does. I musically, it's really hard to get into, but I mean, it's his personality though that just leads into it. I just didn't appreciate his voice until recently. And this album opens with a cover of Somewhere from West Side Story. <laughs> Great. If you don't get Tom Waits, listen to that cover. You'll get Tom Waits. Yeah. Uh, until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. <laughs>